and they can't see. Okay. I think we're good. Mostly. Good evening, everybody here. We have a little bit of an audience here, actually a real audience, which is nice and a big audience out there. Um, introduce myself briefly. I've been a member of uh, the club here, the society for a number of years, probably two more, more than I want to think about right now. Um, and I want to talk a little bit tonight about uh, composition, but it's in the wild. And what, what I want to focus on is, you, I've get, given talks before that are really quite technical. I want to try and back off from that and really talk a little bit from about what drew me into photography, photography in the first place. I'm a retired engineer of 40 years, and I've worked uh, a lot of different things, including some optics and some spacecraft and various systems. And what drew me into photography was I could take that technical expertise that I loved and get to be an artist. And that's kind of what I want to talk about. So tonight, uh, focus a little bit. Starting point is there's no such thing as art. There are only artists. And that's kind of where I want to keep going here. So you, the artist, is who I want to talk to. OK? Um, photography is art. You know, there is no such thing as art, per se. It's only the artists that are important. And it's art is the conscious use of skill and creative imagination to express some subjective reality that's in your mind's eye. So how does that apply? So every time you create a photograph, you're making countless decisions. You may not even think about them, but I'm encouraging you tonight to pause a little bit and think about what you're doing when you begin to take a picture. And what do I mean about in the in the wild? Well, it's in a it's in you know, it's in nature. And that can be a very broad interpretation of nature without any care. Let me admit this person. Okay. Typically, the subject that you're attracted to or are trying to capture in your art is outside of your control or outside of your care. And usually of a fleeting nature. You don't have a lot of time to set up. You don't have time to consider. It's of a fleeting nature. So that's what I mean when I say in the wild. In the studio, wherever you can think of a studio, uh, you control everything. You control the lighting, you control the subject, you can you can pose, you can create mood. But when you're photographing in the wild, and I'm thinking expansively, I don't just mean wildlife, usually everything is working against you. Okay, you have uncontrolled lighting, you may have chaotic backgrounds, you have weather to work with. You lose a lot of control that you might have had in the studio or a more controlled situation. So that's where we're entering into tonight. So I'm talking about now that Composition, okay? What is that and why is that now under your control? Art in the photographic art is how we order the picture space when we're in the wild. So those are the decisions you're gonna to start to make. You know, the light is the light, the weather is the weather, okay? Your subject is gonna do what they wanna do, but you control the composition. How you order the picture space, very important. How you use the light, weather, subject, and background. How much detail you want to include or exclude. And that's where we're going to focus a lot on that tonight. You use, and you can use elements to create lines and patterns. Typically, that's not the fundamental part of what we're going to talk about tonight because of the fleeting nature and the things that are outside of your control. There are two major tools we're going to talk about that are in your control. Oops, I was on the wrong spot. Okay. Let me go. There we go. Yeah. So where to where to it, to begin? Shall I admit this person? Yeah, you should do that. I'll okay. take care of that. Very good. So where to begin? Well, composition is how we want others to see and experience what you're creating, what you're creating your art. It's a big topic. You know, you think of composition, you think leading lines, rule of thirds, patterns, foreground, background. I'm going to call those elements of design, but in the in the wild we typically don't have that much time to consider all that. Yes, you can capture them if you can, but there's two major composition tools that I wanna to talk to tonight. One is depth of field. You'll see it abbreviate, abbreviated a lot by as DOF, and one is perspective. So with that, we'll start off with, oops, I to get my, in the right spot, depth of field. It's a key tool. And what it's key to is how do you include or exclude stuff in your composition. 
It's a major factor in controlling that detail. So if you can control that detail, you can make your subject the point of, of interest in your composition, and that makes it pop the way you'd like to. But I wanna tell you that depth of field is way more than just picking a wide open f-stop. Okay, and that's what we're gonna get into tonight. As an example, here are two, two images of an uh, oyster catcher. One shot at f2.8, one shot at f8. I want you to figure out which one's which, okay? All right. F8 is on the left, two eights on the right, okay? So it's more than just aperture, and that's what we want to talk about. Distance to subject, you're going to hear me take, say this over and over again, distance to subject, distance to background are the two major factors here. Other factors are sensor size, focal length, and something we call bouquet, which we'll talk about in a minute. All affect up the field, and that's a, thus they're going to affect your composition. So understanding the use of depth of field is key to your artistry. And I want to, that's what I want you to walk that's away not. from tonight is how do you use depth of field, not necessarily depth of field charts mm -hmm. or in-depth understanding the optics, although we'll get into that a little bit to give you a basis. Mm -hmm. And then how do you use it? That's the important thing. So does depth of field equal bouquet? And for those not sure what bouquet is, it's that really fuzzy background that's totally out of focus and creamy looking, that's bouquet. So they're not the same, depth of field and bouquet. I did a depth of field talk seven years ago now, 2014, more than that. And people kind of glazed, my wife kept telling me, go to the next chart, go to the next chart. They're, they're, they're falling asleep, you know? <laughs> so, but if I reframe this discussion in terms of that creamy background, the bouquet, people tend to, get more interested, um, but they're not the same, okay? Bouquet is created by the use of depth of field. And that's what I want you to understand tonight. So here we'll get into the great and gory depth of all the optics involved in, no, I'm kidding. I'm not gonna do this, but <laughs> this is a slide from back in 2014. And what I do want you to understand because I use it several times tonight, is the upper right here, when you see this graphic here, I want you to understand what you're seeing. So you're actually, this is represents a lens, and it's like you're looking sideways at your camera, okay? And the, the camera's pointed off to the left in this particular uh, chart. And what this is, is a point, think of it as a LED Christmas light bulb, if you wanna think of it that way. And it's right on the plane of focus, it's where you focus the camera. And the cone that's coming off here, right here, light rays are going, coming off that LED in every direction, but the ones that are going in straight lines are gathered by the lens. That's why there's a whole bunch of light rays in here, gathered by the lens and focused at the sensor plane. And you see it as a dot, a nice sharp dot. It's nicely in focus, okay? If Everything held the same. Your camera's on a tripod, focused on the light on the Christmas tree. If there's something farther away than the plane of focus, you can see it comes in here. When you hit the plane of focus, it's no longer a dot. It's if you're looking at it sideways now, it's really a circle looking at it, looked at sideways. So it looks in the image plane as this fuzzy dot. It's not sharp anymore, it's a dot. If it's too close, the same thing happens only it focuses behind the, the sensor plane. And again, it's a fuzzy dot. So with that in mind, it's kind of key to the discussion we're gonna go into. So there's a range of, of distance that's called the depth of field where things are sharp enough that you can't tell the distance difference. And when you look at an image, really they're all, it's a combination of points in that image that all come together to form it, all right? So let's, let's go away from that. Let's talk about the illusion of depth of field. Still using this as the idea. So there's only one two-dimensional plane when you set your camera up, when you're focused on something, something that's exactly sharp at your focal point, that your focus point is a two-dimensional plane going through that point. And if you look down here, a Christmas bulb on that plane would appear as a sharp dot. As you move away in either direction, where's my, there we are. As you move away in either direction, either away or toward the camera, points, bulbs that were uh, further away from that point of focus become larger and larger unfocused dots. 
the distance, let me go to my next chart. So everything beyond that plane gradually goes out of focus. And the depth of field is the illusion of what we of what else seems like it's in focus. So if you look at it, there's a distance called the depth of field where all those dots that aren't exactly on the point of focus are still sharp enough that you can't tell the difference and it looks sharp to you. So that's what's called the depth of field. Some, dis some distance away from that plane, things no longer feel in focus and it continues to get worse and worse as you go further and further out. And that's where you say, ooh, it's out of focus. Or if it gets way in the distance, now it looks like bouquet. All right, so keeping that in mind, you got a second? So, depth of field is the zone of what appears to be an acceptable focus. And you hear terms such as greater or deeper depth of field, which means a wider zone, it's a deeper zone front to back, the more stuff is in focus. If you hear of a shallower or a less depth of field, it's a smaller zone front to back, talking about distance front to back, and there's less stuff in focus. And why it's important in composition in the wild is it determines in your composition what will be part of your composition and what will not be part. I don't mean that it's not, it's still in your field of view, but you're going to determine what is fuzzy and what's sharp. And we'll show you how that becomes important to how you compose. So you usually can't pick, as I just said, what's inside, okay, your, your composition. It's not like painting where you can say, well, I want a tree here. I want a little brook over here. I'd like some stones there. You can't do that. But depth of field gives you a tool to control that which can't be controlled when you're out in the wild. Here's an example. I shot this uh, with a 200 millimeter lens at f4. The background, this hedge or whatever it is, was about 20 meters away. And there was a significant amount of detail in the background that I felt distracted from this composition. So it, be it began to flir flirt with ruining the photograph for me because it didn't really pop. I, I kind of, it was distracting. Okay. So a mid telephoto and a low f stop, f4 was pretty low wasn't good enough to for me to exclude stuff in the background that I wanted to exclude. Here's another example. Okay, a little warbler. Here the background was roughly the same distance away. This green back here was about the same distance away. There was virtually zero detail in that background. Okay. So, and the same for the stalks that are close to both in front and behind the subject. Zero detail means there are zero things that are potentially distracting from what I wanted to focus on in terms of the composition, the bird. It allows me to simplify the composition. Okay, here a longer lens, but a higher f-stop, meaning a smaller physical aperture, helped do the trick. So it was 420 millimeters, longer lens, but actually a smaller f-stop. So that should have given me a de deeper depth of field. So how come did this work? Okay, well, we'll talk about that. Here we go with distance and depth of field. I really like this picture. I spent a fair amount of time. I was actually sitting in the car out in Middle Creek on the road, and the uh, red winged blackbird was only about 20 feet away. But there was more at play here, okay? And there's more at play than just picking a wide open f stop, okay? Or the lens width. I needed to somehow remove the front, back, the very close front foreground from being distracting and it certainly removed the background. And then when I did that was I used a longer lens and the key was I moved in close, okay? Actually, if sitting in your car is a pretty good blind. And I maneuvered the car up close enough, I got to about 30 feet away and I had a five, six lens and a 420 millimeters and gave me about four inches depth of field. Remember the chart, the blurred circles. So that depth of field distance front to back of what seemed to be in sharp enough focus of those blur circles was about four inches. So when I focused on the bird's eye, I could get roughly two inches behind and two inches in front, enough to keep the bird in focus, enough to give the context of the surround, yet not everything else was kind of removed from the composition. So that removed the detail and foreground and the background, and the distances were key 
okay? You're gonna hear distance over and over now. Depth of field is more complex than just apertures and even more than just focally. So it's all about the distance. It really is. It's completely dependent. Your depth of field is gonna be completely dependent upon distance. And that's what I want. When you go out there and compose and you're in the excitement of seeing something and you're want wanting to figure out what to do, keep that in mind. That's really one of the most important things. So F2.8 does, you know, a wider, a wider open lens does produce a shallower depth of field in general than an F8. But they can produce the same creamy bouquet in the background if you want it to. And the if you want it to is the distances involved. Okay, so distance is the key. The farther the background from the subject, the softer it's going to be. And the closer you get to the subject, the shallower the depth of field will be. It also throws the background out very quickly because relatively speaking, the background is receding now. So it goes to the first point. The farther the distance is away from your point of focus, the creamier it's gonna be. So here we go again, right? But I wanted to show you this, to go over it again here. So here's the lens, here's the plane of focus, here's an LED, you know, a really bright little light here. It's the, the lens is gathering light from that LED, okay? And down here we have our, our blur circle chart. So if I had a point in the background, an LED now way in the background, see what it looks like on the plane of focus? I'm looking at the sideways view of a circle. It's going to be really big. It's gonna fall outside the realm of the depth of focus. If I have something in the foreground, and it's gonna look like this, by the way, the dotted lines, because I'm looking in, in subject space, not image space in the camera, but believe me, it's the same thing if dealt with appropriately. What happens is now that's also outside of the depth of field and it gets to be a bigger circle. So keep that's that's why that's what I wanted you to get to understand the further background is from the subject, the softer it's going to be, meaning the bigger circle. You can think of trying to paint the background a nice detailed you know picture of the background with a two inch brush. Okay. That's that's what that appears when you get a blur circle like that. You're trying to paint something of detail with a two inch brush. What happens? It's going to get all blurred out and look really soft. Here's an example. Now, this isn't in the wild, but it gives you an idea of what points are behind the, the point of focus and what happens in front of the point of focus. These are in front and they get blurry. These in the background, you can actually see how the circle, the points in the background that are LED lights become circles. So what happens now that when you move closer to the subject, okay, now the point of the plane of focus is closer to the lens, okay? We move from this point to this point. If I have a point in the background, what's happening? It's even a bigger blur circle. See, so just looking at the geometry, that's all, okay? It gets even bigger. So the further away you can get the background from the plane of focus, the more soft it's going to become. And what happens now when you get in a point in front of that point of focus, you can see it gets even, it gets blurred out, but a little movement here because of the angles involved, make the circle, little movement forward or backwards toward the lens or away from the lens, really shift the size of that blurred circle on your, on your focal plane, okay? So that's when I say the closer you get to the subject, the shallower the depth of field, the narrower this range down here becomes of your little blur circles being something you can't tell when you look at the image. So it looks sharp. Here's an example of as a close focus on this uh, grass in, in uh, winter, there was some hoarfrost on it. There was a sun sparkling off uh, a, a little river in the background, a creek. The subject was about two feet away. The background was about 30 feet away. And you can see what the glints looked like. They become very big blur circles. So just thinking, that's trying to give you an idea of what's really happening when we say this. So now we're going to move on just a little bit here to talking about aperture size and its effect. So you have an F4 picture over here on the left. I guess, yeah, it's the left. And an F10 picture on the right. They're two very different apertures that you would think would have a different background effect. But they don't in this case. 
they both have creamy background and the reason is the distance. The llama on the left, I was quite close and focused and while the background was only maybe four or five feet away, the fact that I was very tight to the subject allowed me to blur out that background at up four. The bird, I was about 30 feet away, but the background was, relatively speaking, even further away, even though I was at F10, because the background was relatively distant, it blurred away, and I was able to focus and compose on the subject. If you have any questions, chat away, <laughs> okay, on the chat box. So again, distance is key. So we want our subjects to pop in the composition. Remember, we're artists now. We're making decisions in terms of what you see in the viewfinder or in the in the image space on, on your camera, and you're trying to compose. And distance now is something I want you to keep in mind. Distance to the background and distance from the lens to the subject really shapes what you can include or exclude from your composition due to the blurring effect or the limiting of the depth of field. It's, it's, as I was just saying, it's why we obsess over depth of field and bouquet because it enables us to move things in or out of the composition. Large aperture is still very useful. There's sometimes great focus on being able to get to an F1.8 or an F1.4 or an F2. And it's still good to do because you can, you can control that depth of field even easier the wider you can go, but you can still, understanding the distances as a key, get an effect you might want to use. Okay, but there's more than just distance, okay? Depth of field is also has a significant impact because of the focal length of the lens you're going to use. Here's just a little bit of a, a, a table of uh, lenses. What I've shown here is the fact, that it's a fact that you go from a longer lens to a, you're gonna get a shallower depth of field and a shorter lens, you get a, a, a deeper depth of field. So here we have a subject at 50 meters. And the only thing that changed here was change the lens, okay? So at a lens at 600 meters and an F4 aperture, I had five and a half feet. As I get to a shorter lens, I'm trying to open up the aperture just to keep the depth of field shallow. But you can see even at 400 and at F2.8, so I want to stop down. Okay, dropped to 400 millimeters. Now I'm at eight and a half feet front to back. Things are going to be sharp at that distance, front to back, eight and a half feet. 200 millimeters, I've got a really wide open lens. It's a big lens at 200 millimeters, 1.8. I'm at 22 feet. So you can see there's a significant impact, even more than aperture of the lens length. Okay, so you say, okay, that's interesting, but so what? Well, Going from five feet to eight feet or from five feet to 22 feet, that extra three or 15 feet means little if you're kind of in an open prairie or it doesn't have much in the background. But if you're shooting in a forest, okay, where you got a lot of trees or you get a lot of foliage, you got things that are distracting you, three feet can make a big difference. Hey, and that's Tom, the thing that you want to know. Yes. We have a question. It's from David. Since f stop is a product of focal length, what's the difference between f2 at 70 millimeters and f2 at 200 millimeters? Okay, good question. And I'll show you that in just a second. But remember, your f stop is a dimensionless number. And as you get the f stop by the focal length of the lens divided by the physical aperture size of the opening of the aperture. So in this case, I have a let's go 600 millimeters f4. So the physical aperture in a 600 millimeter lens that's f4 is 150 millimeters in diameter, okay? That's pretty big. That's why when you get long lenses, you don't get down to f, low f numbers very much because they get big very fast. Remember, focal length divided by the aperture size, not the aperture number, but the aperture size. So if I had a 50, mil, 50 millimeter lens, okay, and I had f4, the actual opening of the iris there in the middle of the lens to give an F4 is 12 and a half millimeters. That's on a 50 millimeter lens. So that, that way you can use the same F-stop over any lens length, you're gonna get the same amount of light in. That's the, that's the basic root of it, okay? I hope that answered the question. Um, so I wanna say, so get from it, you don't have to know the whole depth of field table, but you ought to take some of your favorite lenses, particularly longer ones, 
and get to know a little bit of what the depth of field is at various focal lengths, and, or excuse me, at very, various focus distances and various apertures. So you have an understanding. So here's an example of a distracting background the guy solved, okay? So the great bouquet helps solve this. So this little sparrow, there was a lot of you know, grasses and things in the background that if they were in focus, would I wouldn't even find the sparrow. I had difficulty finding it anyway. But if I used the 420 and I even used the F10, okay? But the closer subject, which was about 20 feet, gave me a depth of field of three inches, okay? So everything behind there was all out of focus and there was enough of the dried weed or whatever the little sparrow was on that it gave a context for the picture. Okay, so it isn't just a wide open f-stop. You need to understand the relationship. Okay, moving on, still talking depth of field, okay? There's a little bit more to this and that's what about sensor size or crop factor? Okay, and what this picture shows you here is just to give you an understanding, this blue triangle here, or triangle, yeah, this blue rectangle is a rep representative of a, this is the actual sensor in your camera. If you have a mirrorless camera, you take the front lens off, you'll see the sensor sitting there. This is the physical size. If you have full frame, 35 millimeter, it's 36 millimeters, where's my, there you are, 36 millimeters by 24 millimeters. So that's the blue, blue square. If you have an APS-C sensor, sometimes called a crop sensor, there's a number, there's a range of sizes, but typically they're on the order of one and a half. So they're about two thirds of the size of a full frame sensor. I've moved to a uh, Olympus uh, OM-1. It's what's called a four thirds crop sensor, four thirds of an inch. It's one quarter the physical area, two times the crop factor of the full frame. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about how that affects depth of field. And you can see other sensors here. As you get smaller and smaller and smaller, that little question we had about aperture, okay? So for the same field of view, as your sensor size gets smaller and smaller, your physical diameter of the iris, of the opening that lets the light in to give the same f-stop, as you see, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. You're getting really small. Here you're down here about that's the size of an iPhone right here. You know, you're about five millimeters by three and a half millimeters. So you can figure out what an F, you know, F4 is gonna be. It's really tiny. If you think about our geometry chart I showed you earlier about the light rays calling, coming off the LED, that shrinks down and you get an extremely large depth of field now because it doesn't open up much as you move away from the point of focus. That's why iPhones and small cameras don't need a focus system that's very great because it's already got a huge depth of field, okay? So what does that do? It's, it's a function, so we've learned depth of field and bouquet are a function of distance, focal length and aperture. It's also impacted by sensor size, and I won't go into, there's a lot of technical details in here. If you wanna dive into it sometime with me, I'll do it. But if you look up there on the right, there's your sizes of your sensors. And there's just the fact, the smaller the sensor size, the smaller the physical aperture for the same f-stop and the same image size on the actual sensor. So if I filled the sensor top to bottom with a bird and I filled the sensor on a full frame camera top to bottom with a bird, okay, the smaller physical aperture on the smaller sensor will drive a deeper depth of field, okay? What does that mean? It means it'll be deeper by one f-stop smaller this is relative to a full frame camera for an AS, APS-C and two f-stops smaller for a micro four thirds. It's, it's just good you understand that, okay? And again, in applying things. Um, it's good for macro close in photography because typically the closer in you direct the depth of field shrinks with, excuse me, with a smaller sensor size, you get a little bit deeper depth of field. Not so good if you're telephoto far away unless you really want to narrow depth of field and then you're gonna have it. So just keep that in mind. Oops, I clicked on the wrong thing. Okay, here's the sensor size example. Here's a Raven I took this past summer, 300 millimeters F4, micro four thirds. So if I look at our sensors here, the bird in this image 
on the, on the red rectangle, which is the micro four thirds, just about fills that space top to bottom. If I took the same image on a full frame camera, it's the white rectangle, the white background, and you can see the bird doesn't fill it. What do I have to do for it to get the same size bird on the image plane? What would I have to do? I'd have to get in closer. Yeah, but I'm, the easiest way is to get in closer right now, supposedly, we'll talk about it. But in terms of understanding, what happens when you move in closer, okay? You reduce the distance to the subject, the depth of field gets shallower. So that's why a full frame camera has a, sh has a shallower depth of field for the same image size on the sensor plane as, as a crop sensor does, okay? So crop cameras effectively increase depth of field by creating a greater working distance. You can get further away to get the image you want. I'm not gonna talk a lot about a depth of field table. I have an example on the next chart, but the, the key here is understand how to use the factors to increase or decrease depth of field. That's what we wanna walk away with time. That's what we should know how to control. Here's an example, just a little bit of depth of field calculator online. And you should question a little bit about what's happening up here. It puzzled me for a bit. I'll tell you about that offline, but it has to do with how depth of field calculators work. It has to do with the viewing distance of whatever the size of the image that they're talking about, okay? But if I have a subject 100 feet away, I got a long lens going down to a shallower lens, both at the same f-stop. Here's the physical size over here of the aperture. You see 150 to 600 divided by 150 is four. 300 divided by 75 is, whoops, let's go back. Four. And here's the depth of field. So it just shows that, again, the depth of field goes up by about a factor of two when I have a micro four thirds camera versus a full frame for the same subject, but different lenses. So I have about a lens. So you, you see on, a, on an Olympus camera, I have my 300 millimeter is equivalent to a 600 millimeter on a full frame. That's true in terms of the image size on the focal plane. So if I have a bird top to bottom on my cam four thirds camera and I have a bird top to bottom on a full frame camera, that's the difference over here. Where's my, over here in terms of the depth of field, okay? And here's what I would have to do for the same situation, but if I wanted to keep the depth of field relatively the same. So that's what I want you to understand a little bit about crop factor, okay? Since getting in close is really a key to getting a, a great bouquet and a deep background, there's two ways to do that. You can have a high resolution sensor with the attempt to crop in, crop down, and you can use tele teleconverters. Both impact the depth of field and the bouquet of an image. If your intent is you shoot and crop in on the subject to get close, and there's many reasons why that may be what you wanna do, using a high resolution sensor, typically 30, 30 megapixels and up, as you crop in on your subject to make it larger in your composition, your end, your end image, you end up with a deeper depth of field than if you had moved, just simply moved in closer, as we just talked about, to get it to the same size. So focal length and distance is, has significantly infects your depth of field, okay? You lose some power of depth of field as a tool if all you're doing is trying to crop on a big sensor. Just want you to understand that. There's many reasons why it may be necessary to do that. I mean, I've done it. Mobility issues, I'm not surprised I used to be. Long lenses on big cameras are expensive. Uh, you cannot, I choose not to carry the big heavy lenses that I carried 15 years ago. And that's why I've kind of moved down to a micro four thirds. And there may be site restrictions or hazards that you are just not allowed to get 50 feet from the wolf or 50 feet from the grizzly bear, okay? So what's your other option? If you can't get closer physically, the alternative is the teleconverter, okay? And simply put, so a teleconverter is an add-on lens, usually goes between the lens that you were using and the camera. Okay, you'll see them listed as 1.4X or 2.0X. I wouldn't go much more than that. 1.4 means that it increases the focal length by 1.4 and it increases the effective f-stop by a plus one. So you're going to a four to a five, six. 
when you use a 1.4 televert converter. Higher f-stop means increased depth, depth of field. So what's the benefit? Well, the benefit is the focal length more than outweighs that increase of one f-stop. Okay. And you can, you can check that out by just checking some depth of field calculations. But you get a shallower overall depth of field, and that's another way of getting closer. Okay. So we've covered depth of field. The other major tool we have when we're, when we're trying to compose in a wild environment is perspective. Okay, perspective is what I mean about how the subject is perceived in your composition. It's relation to all the other stuff in the composition. It's more than just vanishing points, but it can completely change the look and feel and psychological or the feeling of the composition itself. So the decisions you're gonna make with perspective in mind, close or far, high or low, how does the subject relate to the background and the environment which you have within your field of view? Okay, do you include or exclude foreground elements? It might give the impression of depth and dimension. How do you create or do you want to create a mood and what is it? Is it powerful, is it meek, or is it neutral? These decisions impact the perspective of how you choose to shoot and compose the particular image. So camera angle and low angle perspective in particular is a particular power, is a particular power in composing uh, when you're in the wild, okay? It does a number of things by getting low. It breaks up the picture space. It separates the subject from the environment. It creates the illusion of three dimensions. These seals, we were in a, uh, a zodiac a little ways away from them, and I was literally hanging a couple inches off the water to take this picture. And it allowed me to bring the ice in the foreground and blur out the ice in the background, give you a feeling for what their environment was like and it gave some depth to the image and the composition. So get lower than the eyes of the subject. In general, that's a good rule, okay? The subject will appear larger to life, throws the background in the distance, gives you stuff in the foreground that you may be able to shoot through and give some dimension to your, to your image. Large, and keep in mind, larger subjects are gonna appear more powerful and vice versa. So when you're trying to create a mood or a feeling, keep that in mind. Getting low may completely transform images, okay? And here's an example, power of getting low. Here's a basic shot, shot of an image, or excuse me, of a bird, uh, a shorebird standing in the water, okay? Typical everyday photo, little thought to the composition, and certainly not very exciting. Here is the same shot taken a few moments later, but getting down below the eye level or at the eye level of the bird. And what it did was it brings the other bank into the composition. It narrows the amount of water that may have been distracting over here. And it gives you a much nicer reflection by blurring out the foreground. So same bird, same light, same pose, same everything. Getting low is a completely different feeling. And that's the power of choosing your perspective. So the lower you go, the more powerful the subject becomes. And it makes the subject bigger than life and more imposing. Brings you into their environment. Gives you a feel, brings the, that's what you want to do. You want, you're creating your art. You want the viewer to come in and see what you're trying to create the feeling of, okay? It taps into the evolutionary bio, biology of paying attention to big animals or big subjects. So perspective, you know, choose your camera angle. It's really important when you're composing in the wild. So let's go through some examples and go over a little bit what we've talked about here. So I mean, in the, in the wild, there are environments that you have very little control over. So how do you compose? Your decisions are gonna inform that composition. Okay, Create, in creating those compositions, you have two powerful tools available to you at all times. One is selectively using depth of field to selectively include or exclude things from your composition. And the other is engage the viewer with the subjects of your choice of your camera angle. Okay, depth of field, the key part is, farther the background, the softer it will be, the closer the subject, the tighter or shallower the depth of field. And camera angle, get low, will give you perspective. So we'll go through a couple of quick examples. Here I, I got, so we critique it here. So we got an eye level with a bear, which helps. It, what it did was it brings the background back there into the composition, giving it some feeling of depth. 
I had a long lens, so it blurs the background. So it's 300 millimeter on a full frame at F7 at about 100 feet. So the depth of field was about 10 feet. When I looked on a calculator, I didn't know it at the time. Um, and improvements, I don't know why I was shooting at F7, okay? I could have, I had enough light, I could have stopped down to a lower f-stop. If I went to f4, I would get to five feet. I would I would still have the full bear in focus, but I may not have some of this distracting area in the background and maybe not in the foreground, so the bear would pop more, okay? And if I got even lower, there might have been something in the foreground that it looks like there's some grasses over here, but I might have had to get a little wet to do that, so. Here's another shot, it's out of Middle Creek. So, Low eye level brings uh, with the birds in flight, okay? The background brings the background into the composition. There's a feeling of depth by doing that rather than shooting down on the birds. Okay, longer lens shortens the depth of field. I'm at about five feet when I look at the 420 F8 lens, okay? And I had a teleconverter on. So well, how might I improve this? I, if I could, I might've gotten even closer. Um, I was about, what did I say, 100 feet away. I might've been able to get closer, I'm not sure, but that would have blurred the background even more. It's a little bit distracting. A lower f-stop again, I'm an f8. I could have gone down f5, 6, or even f4, and maybe blurred this out a little more, okay? Here's an example of uh, perspective or point of view. Okay, both shot up at uh, uh, Trexler Town at the velodrome. This one, I was at eye level. I was actually laying on the side of the track, shooting at the riders as they came by at a 300 millimeter F8, okay? Same 300 millimeters, but I was up in the stands or I was on the bridge, I don't remember, shooting down at the, at the riders coming around the corner. There's a completely different feeling in those two shots. And that's, again, depends what I, I, I like the one on the left more. It gives you an idea of, a little bit of an idea of what, what the competition was like. The other one has some interest too, but I like the lower shot. Uh, one more, here's a macro shot. One reason I like micro four thirds, this is a, I can hand hold a 300 millimeter at 10 feet at F4 and get this shot, okay? And it was it's really interesting because I can get 10 feet away from the subject. They're not as skittery. I do have to pay attention to the field or the focal plane, trying to get in the same focal plane as the insect. So, because it's a pretty shallow depth of field, half an inch. Okay. But everything else disappears. Okay. And again, perspective at eye level gives you a different feeling. One more. I needed to isolate the subject from the background. Long lens shortens the depth of field. Getting in closer helped 20 feet. Two inches for depth of field, low eye level. I wish that I had done a little more. I mean, it's a pretty boring shot, actually. If there was some action involved or some foreground to shoot through, it would have been a little bit better. Here's an idea of shooting through the foreground. It's not my picture, it's Jared Lloyd's. But shooting down on the subject means shooting down in the background as well. Okay. So moving down creates three dimensions that gets you through the composition, brings a fewer viewer through it brings forward something to shoot through by getting down also and moves the background away into the bouquet. Just think, if you're shooting down, you're gonna get the ground, okay? Not very interesting sometimes. So, let's summarize. So creativity in the wild, all right? Your artistry, artistry begins when you're in the wild in a different place. And by the wild, I include, you know, sports shooting, even street photography, Places where besides just wildlife photography, you don't have a lot of control over your subject, okay? This all applies. So little in your control, fleeting subjects, a chaotic environment, you need to begin bring your artistry to bear by considering the different uh, tools, that we, the two different tools that we talked about. So create a feeling. Otherwise you may become trapped inside the art of artificial boundaries of snapshots or documenting nature if you're just out there saying, oh, I just gotta, it's, it's there, I gotta take it. Think about it. Get two powerful tools, depth of field. Remember it's about the distance. In, in major part of it is about the distance. Your distance to the subject and your distance to the background. And a longer focal length will help you narrow your depth of field. Perspective, 
or viewpoint or camera angle. You know, you want if you get low, that's the main thing. You create a foreground, a middle ground, a background that gives the, an illusion of depth. Many times that helps improve your photograph. So when the moment happens, it's your decisions, it's your artistry, your composition, using these tools. I hope, as I have done, sometimes captured the magic before me. So that's it. Thank you. And one thing I want to point out. This series was informed by a series of new newsletters by Jared Lloyd, one of my favorite uh, photographers and educators. He has a journal called Wild, the Journal of Wildlife Photography. It's tremendous in terms of what I was just talking about. It's also tremendous in terms of he has an understanding of the wild environment that he shares. It's just amazing in many cases. So I would encourage you to check that out. And that's it. Questions? You can unmute yourselves if anybody has any questions. Feel free to speak out. Okay, Dave Christian. Here we go. I have a question, Tom. Yeah. Um, how often are you getting away and traveling to different locations? Well, this year, uh, Meg and I to traveled go. quite a bit because <laughs> the previous two years, all our plans had kind of slid into 2022. So we were in uh, Yellowstone in the winter, uh, end of January for a week. Uh, we were in, um, then we went to Southeast Alaska for 10 days in uh, July. And then we were up in the Orkney Islands in the north and northern end of Scotland for 10 days in September. And the Oregon coast in March for a little getaway. Yeah, so we, we were fortunate that being retired at, in our health is good at the moment, and uh, we're making the most of it as everybody should, if they can. We're lucky. Yeah, but again, uh, I could go through the, the the technical side of this with anybody that wants to sit down and hatch it out with me, I'd be happy to. Um, but the main thing is just to consider your artistry. It's a couple, a couple tools here that really makes a difference when you don't have a lot of control. So that's it. Yeah. Tom, can you um, address can you address the um, say a typical wide open uh, landscape scene with your wide angle lens um, and you want everything in focus? And how do you go about doing that? Do you do you try to not go too far stopping down because of the concerns of of uh, loss of image quality, say at F16, for do you do focus stacking? At, for diffraction, you mean? Yeah, do you do focus stacking or what, what would be your typical? Well, if you think of that, setting. if that uh, the diagram of the lens and the and the Christmas LED and the way it came to the lens in a triangle kind of, and it was a dot on the focal plane. Remember the size, physical size of that lens, the F-stop, if you shot all lenses at F4, you get the same amount of light through them. But an F4 on a 20 millimeter lens, that opening now is only what five millimeters. That's a you know fifth of an inch. Yeah, fifth of an inch. Okay, pretty small versus an F4 on a 300. Okay, which is like 100 or 75 millimeters. All right. So the triangles of the two. So what I'm getting to, the shorter your your focal length, the deeper your depth of field is going to become. Okay, and so if you're shooting. Uh, Landscape pictures, not particularly. I mean, you got a little more control. You can you can compose a little better. You can look for leading lines. You can. It's not fleeting typically. Um, but if you want to get front to back, you get a wider, get a smaller f-stop. It's going to give you deeper depth of field and a shorter lens. Does the opposite of a long lens, where the long lens shows the background, throws the background into blur. Okay, a short one is going to keep that depth of field really long. In fact, there's yeah, harken back. I know you remember my presentation from seven years ago, but <laughs> but if you focus a lens at infinity, it has a, an interesting characteristic. It's like painting the background, everything you see in the background with that physical size aperture as if it was a brush. So if I've got a 300 millimeter lens at F4, I've got a 75 millimeter, that's a three inch brush. And I'm trying to paint detail. Okay, if I'm focused at affinity, I'm trying to get long, right? I mean, a deep, a deep composition. If I have a 50 millimeter lens and I'm at f4, now I've got that one fifth of an inch brush, 
and I'm painting the background. It doesn't matter, foreground to background. If I'm focused on affinity, I can still see things in the foreground with relative detail, you know, at a fifth of an inch. It's not going to be sharp if I get up right close and look at it, but if I'm viewing it from a couple feet, it's not going to look bad. Mm -hmm. That's why you can get deep. I don't know whether I answered your question, but you, you can you can do focus stacking for sure. You know, if if you if you now you're doing di digital composition, and you can lay a couple, you know, different uh, focal points onto each other and mask them accordingly, and you get a deeper looking image. So, do you have a favorite f-stop for your wide landscape images? Wide landscape images. Um, Normally, I try and just see what, what, what I'm getting in the foreground, and that's what I'm trying to make sure I've got a small enough f-stop that I can resolve some things in the foreground, because that gives me my depth of field. And then if I'm focusing back about a third of the way in, okay, even to the background, that small f-stop is going to give me enough detail in the background. I, I ought to say, though, it was, it was interesting to me on, uh, about a year ago, two years ago, we were out at Middle Creek, and there was a flock of uh, of uh, snow geese, thank you. They were coming over the full moon, which was just coming up on the horizon. Okay, and I thought, great, I'm gonna wait till one goes in front of the moon. And so I focused on the moon. I figured, you know, there, you know I had a 420 millimeter lens. I didn't want to get detail on the bird, but I wanted to get about a 10, 10 bird flock, you know, and they're coming and I had to get it right the exact moment. I thought, they'll be sharp enough. They weren't. Okay, and I looked at it on the viewfinder. I can't believe that I focused on the moon. Okay, infinity away, basically. So then I had to focus on the birds coming up and then leave the focus in manual, don't touch anything, and shoot as it came across the moon. And that worked. But in the moon, you could still you could clearly say it was the moon and you could see some detail on it, but it wasn't nearly as sharp as it focusing at infinity. So again, it's the illusion of depth of field. And the thing that I didn't talk to you about, I'm wandering all over the subject here, but in that depth of field chart, when I had the same shot with a full frame camera, and then I went to a micro four thirds camera, I thought I would get a deeper depth of field in the calculator. Well, I got a shallower depth of field. And the thing that I want to, you have to read a little bit about the depth of field calculator when you're online, read about it, because it's all based upon what you can resolve an eight by 10 print at a foot. So normal eyesight, eight by 10 print at a foot can resolve about a third of a millimeter, okay? So that's the, again, the illusion of depth of field. There are sharper things than that, but you can't see them. So when I took that same bird with my smaller crop sensor, but now I had to blow it up to get to the same eight by 10, what did that do? It made me see the dots that I couldn't see on the full frame camera because it wasn't magnified as much. And that's why the depth of field went down. It's all technical. The point is, when you're looking at a shot like I showed with the either the Christmas tree or the glints off the off the water in the background, if there's no detail there, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know how big or small you're looking at your image. Okay, it's still going to be out of focus. So, and and have some bouquet to it. Think about it. I, I took about six weeks putting this together. And I probably had it together in about two weeks. And then I kept going through it in my head and at night and seeing now why was this working? Why wasn't that working? And it took me a while to get comfortable with the whole thing. So I can only imagine when you have some questions, shoot them to me. Yeah. If you're shooting the animals in the wild, then are you out of priority? It it depends. If I'm shooting birds, then I'm I'm shutter priority because I need to stop the motion. Okay. If I was shooting the the spirit bear on the cover photo, I'm not expecting them to move too fast. So then I'm kind of, I'm typically, I'm almost moving to ISO auto and leaving the, the aperture and the speed alone and letting the, the ISO go automatic on me. Cause then I can I can do get the best of both there. Cause if the bear is moving as it was flashing around there, um, you want to be able to freeze that. So then I, I let the ISO go auto, which, which brings noise into it sometimes, but it's what you got. Tom, what's the longest zoom lens that you're using in the field? The so the longest lens I have right now is a 300 millimeter prime lens. 
And I have a, a 1.4 teleconverter. That's why you see a, a number of those shots are at 420 millimeters. But that's on a, uh, you know, a, on a, an Olympus camera. So that's equivalent to about an 820 millimeter on a full frame camera in terms of reach. Okay. And I might say it's about a fifth of the weight for the, for the same probably, f-stop and the size. So probably half the cost. I I follow some different uh, wildlife photographers like Buddy Elizier. I think that's how you say his name. Anyhow, um, uh, we had uh, Uchara. Um, she shoots Olympus also, and she uses that 150 to 400 Olympus lens. Yeah. Um, it, like you said, it's like half half the weight and right. half the cost and superb quality. Um, so I just yeah, that, that was one of my biggest concerns when I went from a full frame Nikon to the Olympus was, was I going to be satisfied with the quality? And I'll, I'll tell you. It's it's not quite the cal the caliber of the quality, but it's every bit near good enough for me. And the most important thing for me now is I got to be there to get the shot. And if I'm hunking around these ten and twelve pound things into the environment, I'm not getting there. So it's important to be there, and you got to do that first in order to make everything else work. And you're probably enjoying you're enjoying your time out in the field a lot more because you're not schlepping the stuff around. You're exactly right. Yep. Yep. Does that sensor side affect? Well, it, it it so it's you got it to get an eight. So it's if I had an eight by ten in print from a full frame camera, if I had the same image shot on my on my four thirds camera, it would be a four by five with at the same magnification. So I've got a magnify it more to get up to an eight by 10. And that's when you begin to wonder about quality. But I'll tell you with the tools that are available to you today, I, I use the on one software a lot. They've come out with uh, artificial intelligence composite or uh, digital comp digital tools that man, it deals with noise and it deals with enlargement to an amazing degree, way more than I could five years ago even. So there are things to consider. You have to think about the whole system, okay, from the point you see something to the point you're going to get a print of it or where it shouldn't say a print, wherever you're going to display it. If you're going to display it only online, you don't need to worry much about any of this in terms of the image quality because you're never going to see it online. Okay, you'll see the composition and that's still important, but the image quality won't be that well. If you're going to take your print and display it in the medical buildings that we've been the privilege to display now you're up to what is it 16 by 20 or bigger i don't 30 remember by 30 by 40 okay so you have to bring that into consideration okay and you have to pay attention to carefully attention of your of your technique in terms of getting a sharp print or a sharp image and then you can work from it from there i got to say that the artificial intelligence you know noise and the enlargement tools are really good but if you got an out of focus image they're not going to help you Okay, they don't work that well on those. So you still have to have a good technique. Tom, have you used Topaz's Gigapixel to no, scale yet. your images? No. I just, I haven't had to go really big. You know, I've just used them, particularly since I have a crop sensor that, uh, you know, when I get up to 16 by 20 or even up to 30 by 40, I'll use them then. And they do a pretty good job. If I was to go even bigger than that, I don't know because I don't have much call for that in, in the way I'm displaying it. Okay, I enjoyed it. Hope you did too. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. For those who are still at home, this is Vince. I, I wanna tell you that how great it is to be here with uh, 10 other photographers and friends. Uh, this really is quite different than sitting at home. Yeah. Come on in. Yeah, it's fun. It's nice to see real people. <laughs> Did you have pizza tonight? Oh, we're talking about alcohol next time. <laughs> that might bring people yeah, in. <laughs> yeah, but, but that means everybody has to drive home, too. So we have to be careful of that. Um, yeah. Thank you, Tom, very much. Yep. You're and and I noticed the big uh, big improvement in my photography by 
getting a longer lens yeah. and some of the some of the close stuff yeah. real soft bokeh yeah. yeah so is there any any anything in the chat uh jay that you can i don't see anything else um i think you answered all the questions Anybody? all right just a lot of good positive comments yeah it was fantastic tom you really go into a lot of detail and we love seeing your images very nice well thanks i think it could get more technical <laughs> if you really want to <laughs> careful i might pick you up on the challenge i, I, I so. saw he had some uh, special extra slides there that he was yeah, trying I to did. click on i did, I did yeah <laughs> Not everybody has the same mathematical mind that you do, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jenny's too artsy. <laughs> yeah, everything everything I'm doing is blurry, and it's all, I just call it art. <laughs> it's, just, it's just art. <laughs> the blurrier, the better, I think. <laughs> well, just remember, everybody, uh, in two weeks, we're going to have our, our uh, members meeting. And we will be sending out that link uh, for you to upload your images for the uh, sure. for the share presentation. Okay. Yeah. Um, Jeff, we used, we used to just send that, that up to Smugbug, right, Jeff? No. Yeah. Okay. Which is what, we'll do that again this year. Yeah, and I think the folders might I, I, still so be there. Dependent upon the image. So, you know, so so you uh, just have to send uh, it would be some link again. Right. The what's, yeah. what's the deadline for yeah. that? Do you know? Yeah. Oh, probably the weekend before the meeting. Okay. <laughs> that's when I'll put it together. Get, get up to twenty-two. I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll give you a deadline. It'll be, it'll be you probably know, five days out from the at meeting. The physical size of that aperture. Yeah. If that so when sense. you get up to, you know, you got a twenty millimeter lens, and you're down to and, and Jenny, we'll, we'll announce what we what we found out today at our at our general it, meeting. It's going to get fuzzy. Okay. They're not. They're not. Yeah, that look. sounds good. I mean, you may not. You may not see the. The video. next. Um, when you newsletter you goes up, out thinking man because i i learned that uh years ago yeah, when, uh, the I mean, 16th on the islands it, and i'm taking this okay. grand picture and i thought wow i'll stop all the way down so, and i'll get everything nice and sharp so now i can hear everybody in the room but i can't hear you, you know <laughs> it didn't work the next newsletter goes out the 16th so if you want to <laughs> send out something about the answer to the people sending in their again. pictures for an year-end slideshow yeah. we'll, we'll send out a special, special notice show. This, then let me know i can send that out by mailchimp too yeah 13. okay mm -hmm. all right so if you were here you could you could hear everybody talking but uh you probably can't so i'm looking i'm looking at you and not the people in the room again so jay you have you have next year all set up don't you no all the speakers are set up no maybe vince does i don't no such thing as so there were a lot of speakers, on. though. Well, I got one. We have one. We have a lot of um, good stuff going on next year. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna do some planning in the next couple of weeks. So let's uh, make sure you uh, show up for the meeting. Is everybody else uh, going to bed now? Yes. Good night, Jimmy. You still teaching, or are you you done teaching now? Um, I'm part time. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm surprised I'm you, you will see it on the so light. Are you enjoying some time off? It doesn't matter how getting out. Yeah, of yeah. It's I mean, I still Tuesday mornings, which is always after this. I still get up my normal yeah. time. I watch my granddaughter that morning. Is, you know, oh, I don't okay. know whether you've seen the. Yeah. Uh, well, that's just fun. Really call, whether whether yeah, you know, it is. Their electrons <laughs> either as a part. This morning, I got up early and I was right. shooting the frozen soap bubbles. Yeah, we saw that. I saw yeah, that. I saw those. You shared those. Yeah, took a light source. Yeah, they I've, put it I've, through I've two been, slits next to each other. I haven't been shooting and a lot. Let's go on a screen. I keep looking out so the window and I'm glued to the computer.